Um, hi everyone, welcome to the second in our live Q&A with the Hockey for Home series, um, sponsored by Jaffa. So um, last week was really cool, we had Mel Clulo here chatting about um, cultures, values and teams, team dynamics, um, so hopefully you guys took something from that. And this week we have uh, the wonderful Andy Halliday, uh, <laughs> team GV manager uh, for, the, for the men's team, joining us today to talk about um, building psychological safety. Um, and we've had some really interesting questions come through already um, about psychological safety um, and how we can develop it within our groups and teams that we're working with. First things first, I think it'd be really interesting to, to, for you guys to explain how and why creating um, psychological uh, well-being and, and what, how that will impact uh, normal teams playing at grassroots level, what is the value of that? How, how can you implement that and, and what's the whole point of it? My question for, or for people to think about there is when you go to your coaching sessions, how many people interact with you at your sessions? And if you have maybe three or four people in a group of what you say have 16 at a training session, maybe a few more, if you have three or four people um, that are constantly contributing, having answering questions, giving their thoughts, opinions and stuff like that across. Um, my question would be, have you as a coach there created psychological safety where everybody feels like they can give their points and share their thoughts and opinions? Why, um, Why is that important? It's, it's massively important because um, when in order for you to um, create, you know, the cultures and the dynamics that we spoke, spoke about last week, um, in order for people to feel valued within that group, um, humans feel valued when they are listened to um, and when people actively listen to them as well. Um, and, and so that's, you know, understand like understanding and appreciating what they're saying nodding along and, and showing really positive body language to pull that before um to that person if someone feels like that they're going to be feel more welcome and more um comfortable and more confident in their capacity to share ideas and share their thoughts and how they're truly feeling as well if you don't have that that's when we can kind of get divides in groups maybe little clicks in groups um and that's where we start to have kind of quite toxic environments develop um I don't, I don't know Andy if you've got anything else to yeah I think the first thing for me is about positive communication uh within within the group I think you know I I, I did turn up when I was coaching at St Norman's and I'm so sure there are a few people on here tonight that will remember uh when I I I, I turned up like a, a bear with a slap backside could I because I'd had a bad day at work and I think if you go in immediately in in the wrong frame of mind and you don't communicate very well, then you are not going to create psychological safety within the group. So I think certainly whether I'm on international duty, whether I'm working um, with, with the company ClearTrack that I work with, whether I, um, I'm involved with, uh, with friends, I, I, I make a real strong effort to, to communicate in a positive way. So I, I'm an active listener. I'm interested in people. I'm interested in what they've got to say and what they've got to do. And I think those that's one of the first steps that you can take to creating that so as a coach you you are a, an active listener you're listening to um, you, you might not necessarily be um, acting on everything you hear but you're creating the environment where we have got effective and positive communication and I think that's really really important because it shows the players the athletes uh, it shows that you you do actually care um, so that that would be my first creating Psychological safety, the first thing for me is to create a positive, try and make it a two-way, strong communication yeah. environment. Um, yeah, I was just asking you, Steph, where, where in your space you, you've experienced that? What, what, where, where have you seen that? Where, where would you think that someone could have done something better? Um, I probably have too many to list, to be honest. Um, I think... Uh, the, the, challenge, the challenge is um, from experience is that you've got a variety of different people um, in, in teaching who are teachers and also you're working with a variety of different people who um, take blame or take responsibility in different ways um, and so you know there, there's there's been there's been loads of uh, loads of times where you know 
kit hasn't been put away in a certain place. Oh, who's done that? Oh, I must find out who that person is. Right, I can't now teach my lesson properly because of this person. Um, you know, that, that probably is something that all PE teachers um, and probably coaches have experienced as well. Um, in terms of pupils, oh, um, I forgot my kit. Oh, it's because my mum or my dad or whoever's at home, um, they, uh, they were in a rush this morning and didn't remind me to pick it up. You know, there's people don't, humans don't want to make, admit to mistakes. People don't, uh, humans don't want to experience failure. Um, that makes them feel uncomfortable. Um, so when we can attribute blame somewhere else, it, it satis as Andy said earlier, it satisfies ourselves into saying, do you know what, that actually wasn't my fault. That's, I can park that, give that to somebody else, give the blame to somebody else. I can move on with my day. Um, so yeah, th I would say that that's something that definitely with um, young people, teenagers in particular, young adults, is taking being accountable and taking responsibility is a skill that is something that really needs to be encouraged within people to say and we, we have if I, I would if I had a pound for every time I'd said it's not your mum's responsibility or it's not your dad's responsibility to for you to have your kit for you to have your mouth guard or whatever for you to do your homework um I definitely wouldn't be a teacher I'd have loads more money Tom, um, Thomas Edison brilliant quote Thomas Edison who invented the light bulb 10,000 times, yeah. he tried, everybody thinks 9,999 times he failed, but he just talks about, no, I just, I just tried it 9,999 times until I got it right. And I think, you know, that view of failure and having this, well, we've failed, we, well, we've failed. We all, everybody make error, makes errors all the time. Errors are part of learning. They're certainly part of learning in a, in a, in a high performing environment. They're part of learning in a, in a club environment. Um, violation is a bit different. So, so error, to err is divine. You know, forgiving, er, er, um, making errors, forgiving, divine stuff. If you get into violation, that's where you're stepping over the line. And then we need a justiceful... Um, environment where if people do need to be uh, punished, if they need to be um, uh, some some form of punishment, I know you spoke a little bit about that last week uh, when you were talking about team culture, but we have to get used to being in an environment where we make errors and creating that psychologically safe environment where people make errors and are not necessarily punished for them, I think is what I'm saying. Okay, sorry guys again uh, for the technical issues, um, but welcome, thanks for persevering with us. Um, we have had uh, quite a few questions come in throughout the day um, through our various social media platforms, so thank you very much for getting in touch with us. Um, so Joel, if you want to share a few of the questions, we'll get answering. And then if you've got any questions that pop up as and when we're talk talking, please do stick them in the comments box. And Joel is playing the role of Michael Parkinson today, so he'll pass them on to us. Uh, cool. Okay, first question. What qualifies a team player? A good team player. Question one. Go on, Andy. Get your whiteboard out. Goodness me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very incredibly broad question. Um, it's an interesting one because um, I have behind me <laughs> pre-prepared. No, but uh, um, the discussion, we, this, this question actually prompted a brilliant discussion this afternoon around, is it more important to have ability or is it more important to have good attitude um, in, in a team? And can you cope if everybody's got a good attitude, but maybe not great ability or everybody is brilliant at everything, but their attitude stinks? Um, and my, my view, and with the teams that I've worked with, both in a sort of specialist policing world, but also um, in a hockey world, club level, moving up to sort of international level, is that you really need a balance. And the team, that team person that ticks the box to all those boxes with attitude is vital, absolutely vital to your team. As almost the, the hub, if you like, you know, the engine block behind the success, you've got to have some good team people. Now, one of the, I guess one of the best um, 
Well, recent recent years, I can I can reel off names of of, of, of brilliant team people. Um, you know, Barry Middleton. I was lucky to work with you know, Kate Richardson, Walsh, Alex Danson. Fantastic team people. The difference with them is that they they have fantastic ability as well. So if you look at my my little chart that I've got behind me here. So um, if, if, if we've got our sort of continuum here of ability on one side, and on the other side, we have our continuum of attitude, where would Barry Middleton sit? He'd be up here. He'd be your ideal player. So actually, it would be fantastic, wouldn't it, if we had a whole team that we could sort of stick, stick in this, um, this top corner here. The whole, but that's not how it works for us. And normally what we, we may well have is we might have some people whose attitude not great, but their you know their ability, they're sort of they're very good, but not good team players. But then we've got these people that generally sit in the middle. Uh, our sort of team players, you know, they're not going to set the world alight. I was one as a player when when I when I played, not brilliant, turning circle of a North Sea ferry decent sort of um, stick skills but I like to think that my attitude was 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 pretty spot on so I would have put myself probably over on on this side ideally what we're going to find whatever team we're in we're going to have a few people over here who probably think they're quite good and they probably are quite good but actually attitude isn't great the more you have over here the more issues you have within your team culture so actually what it's about is a fair smattering, and I'd say a majority of people who are team orientated. Andy, we've got a caveat to that question as well uh, from Steve Asnall. Um, he's from Ackmore Hockey Club. Uh, how does being a better player, sorry, how does being better for the team help you individually? <clears throat> well, I think for me as a coach, Somebody who is a team player is always going to be forefront for me. So quite likely that within a leadership group, you're going to give those sorts of people responsibility on your team because they are the team players, because they're likely to be role models. You know, over the years, we've, we've had, or I've, I've known quite a few people who have, have been real role models over here, but actually not brilliant hockey players, but they're actually really important to the team. I would far rather have somebody who is going to give absolutely everything to the team than somebody who maybe is pretty good, but attitude stinks. That's a personal view for me. I don't know how you feel about it, Steph. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd err on the same, same lines as you. Um, I think when you have one or two of those kind of players, it's manageable um, and you can kind of think, actually it is what they bring in ability wise can can the rest of the group deal deal with the fact that maybe they've got a bit of an ego about them or something like that um but what they bring in terms of performance actually kind of balances out what they don't bring and because you've got a, a good chunk of people that are team players um i think as you say there, Andy, the, da the danger part of it is if we get more and more people go into that more ability and less attitude kind of way. And I think that's where also, you know, having those first few people there who are really good role models, I think that's a really good word, way of putting them um, with that good attitude is, is vital for hopefully them, them sowing the seed with other people so that attitude grows. And that's where we then get that good team culture that we spoke about last week. Okay, so to answer your question, Joel, I think those those sorts of individuals are vital yeah. to the makeup of the team. But it, and I... also, the other thing to think about with that as well is that if you've got, talking about this psychological safety, if you've got people around you that believe in the team and uh, and the kind of, you uphold those core values as a group, you're then going to have people that are willing to make mistakes or are not happy to make mistakes and to talk things through and get people's perspective and kind of, you know, share, share thoughts and ideas, that then means individuals are going to develop because they're going to be learning opposed to... Let me, let me spin that back to, uh, you know, a normal hockey club. So you're at hockey club A, you take over as a coach or you're, you're a player within the, the squads there, whatever team, one through sixes, 
and you identify that, you know what, we've got a few really big characters that can, on their day, make the game, make the day, make the success. On the bad day, they bring the morale of the team down, they're effing and jeffing, they're gobbing off, they're, they're a little bit disrespectful to umpires. How do you, as a manager and as a coach, manage that person or those couple of people when they are in that state? Well, I think the first thing as a manager or coach, it's probably your response. That problem is your responsibility. But I think the most important thing, so if, 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 if you, in a subtle way, and this is what comes around with, again, we're talking about this psychological safety in the team and the ability to have what we call courageous conversations with players um, as coaches. But I think the, the real responsibility and the real emphasis to keep to try and keep these sorts of individuals in line actually lies with this group so it's the responsibility within the playing group to set the standards and make it known that this sort of behavior or this sort of attitude at this end is not acceptable and i think you give you, you know you've got to get everybody deserves a chance you give people these these opportunities it becomes very difficult when players who are sitting on this side are so good that actually your team's success depends on them. And then you've got to get to a point where you've almost got to develop um, a bond within your playing group, within your leadership group, that almost for them to realise that for us to be successful, we've got to have these players in our team. So if that is the case, are we going to accept it as a group? So are we going to accept that these individuals might behave slightly differently to everyone else, but actually it, it, it'll mean that we're still successful. So it might go slightly against our culture, but we have to adjust. I, th I think as, as, as we've previously discussed, it, is, it all depends on the mission statement or the objective of, of that team. So I mean, if, if it's like an international team, then the, the sole focus, I, I would presume, is going to be gold medals at Olympics, World Cups, all that kind of stuff. But for um, maybe a, a more a lower, maybe a team that isn't playing at that level, then I guess, is that is it better to focus on that and look for your results? Or is it better on the cohesiveness of the team? Well, I think you, you look at what, what is our why? What's the why of the team? Now, with, with, with all due respect, if I am playing for a club, maybe sixth or seventh team, it's actually about me enjoying my Saturday afternoon and maybe enjoying my training on a Tuesday night. So am I going to be accepting of the behaviour of people who sort of, you know, pitch up with a, a, a rock bad attitude on a Saturday? Well, I'm probably not because it's going to affect my enjoyment. And ultimately, I'm, I'm paying subscriptions to play hockey at the weekend and it's about me enjoying it. So uh, it, it, there's an interesting balance there, Joel, but you're absolutely spot on with the fact that, you know, we can't, you can't have one rule for one. Obviously, international level, national league level is very, very different. And when we, you know, the higher we go up in sport, the more we see, you know, the value of these sorts of players we will try and move heaven and earth to make sure that they are involved. Interestingly, Legacy, which, which is a, a book by James Kerr, which I, I know was mentioned last week, you know, they, the All Blacks have this sort of no dickheads rule, um, where if, if you don't conform, basically you're out, but you're given the opportunity. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one. It's always gonna be a tough one. And it's, it's, it's not a precise situation, as I say, whether you're at club level or whether you're at international level. Mm. I, I, I guess the, the always, it will always come back to what the objectives are of that team or, or in fact, that club. If you take it out of sport and you move it to a military setup or a firearm setup in the police, if you're a dickhead, then you won't last. And, and that's where it, it does come back to, to that ethos. OK, so going back 30 years when it was, you know, you're the newbie, get the bruise on, sit in the corner, don't say anything. I don't agree with that at all I think that's really wrong but I do think there's an interesting element of well in those platforms because of the objectives of that group they, they don't stand for dickheads and, they, and even if you're 
you know, up here, you know, you can, you can take rooms in a flash, you can do all these skills, but you're an absolute bell end, you won't last. Um, so I do think there is, there's definitely room for that kind of, in my, my personal opinion, I do see value in that to a point, not when it becomes overbearing and you're not creating a real, real safe environment. I mean, for me, I think debriefing is really positive. Some people don't like, enjoy debriefs. They don't like that kind of feedback. But again, I, th I do think some of it's in, in the delivery. But I, I think, uh, I mean, what, what are your views on debriefs? Post-game debriefs in, in hockey, for example. Um, I, know, uh, I know in certain environments that'll probably get quite fiery, quite heated. But if it's a safe psychological platform, that should be positive, right? I mean, yeah. I think with that is that in order for debriefs to be successful, you've got to have done the legwork beforehand in order for, as you say, for that psychological safety to be felt, um, especially in the sense of actually everybody's aware of what the targets are, what the goals are, what we're trying to achieve and how we're trying to do that and the processes that have been set up in and put in place there. But then also um, there's got to be some time and effort taken into developing the relationships of people within that group um, and between coach and players or team manager and players or whoever's the, uh, the lead in that group who's leading debrief so that they understand that actually the, the content that's being covered within that is said in, the re in a really positive way, is said in the, in, with, with positive meaning and isn't just digging people out for the sake of digging, digging people out. And as you said, Andy, earlier, you know, that, that process of active listening um, and that's consistent over a period of time can then mean that those debriefs are actually of value and where people aren't taking the content personally as a personal attack, but actually as a, right, this is, this is what's gone really well here. This is what's not gone so well. So we need to try and balance things out so that we can and, and come up with a plan in order to move on from this point. Um, if you go into a debrief, whether it's after a game or whatever situation you might have those, have debriefs in, if you go in without developing those relationships, without goals and, uh, and processes being established and, you know, having positive expectations within that group that are all mutually agreed, it's going to be a car crash. It's, you're not going to get anything from it. I think, I think the process is really important. Uh, and I think, first of all, as a coach, as a leader, if you are about to facilitate a debrief, are you going to facilitate it? Or is this for you to get something off your chest? Because we all get, and whether we're players, coaches, we all get very emotional at the end of games, particularly if the result's not gone well. So I think you've got to ask yourself, am I doing this just to get this off my chest and put some blame out there, which is what we've spoken about, this emotional unloading of, of blame, or am I doing this for the good of the team? Now, my, my you know, over the years, debriefing has become an integral part certainly of, of in police firearms work we would always debrief and we did it in different ways so at the end of a job there would always be what we call a hot debrief now things might have gone really really well things might have not gone that well we would always have a hot debrief and that is a quick go around the room anybody want to chip anything in anybody for any feelings about whilst it's fresh in our mind and it's quick and it's not necessarily judgmental, it's, it's comment, comment, comment. Hot debrief, we call that. When the dust is settled, we then have a full, what we call a full tactical debrief. It's, it's the, exactly the same in hockey. So you have your very quick hot debrief after the game. You may come away, if you're at international, national league level, you're looking at video sort of performance level. It might be that at lower level, uh, you come away and have a sort of a, an in-depth in tactical debrief, but you're not using video or anything like that. So um, it's really important, I think, to separate the two because you have when you're debriefing, to learn from the debrief, you've got to take the emotion out of what's just happened. And that's really, really important because if you think about the environment we're in, is we're in a learning environment. We are there to learn. A slightly different take on debriefing that we used to use, and I'm sure Joel, um, whether in, in the military or in, in the police, exactly the same, is we would also talk about a defuse or a decompression. 
Defuse and decompression is something a little bit different. It's where maybe something has, has, has happened. So it, it, in hockey, it could be, you know, we've been training for a cup competition for months and months and months. And, you know, we've lost, we've played very badly or something's happened in the game, maybe a bad injury to a player, which means we've actually got to think about the welfare of the group. And we would call that a defuse or a decompression. So that's more about how are we as a group? We think about this psychological safety. So there are, there are different ways of debriefing and it is about learning so that we can be better next time. The defuse or the decompression is about the welfare of the group and how we are operating as a group afterwards. There'll certainly be a number of people either watching live this video or watching it on replay who are either current forces or ex forces decompression to, to, to us to that lot um, certainly when I came back from Afghan it was um we went to uh, Kateri for five days got stuck uh, as second battalion the parachute regiment onto a camp with one bar with 4-2 commando so there was a, a regiment of 4-2 commando a regiment of the parachute a power reg lads and uh decompression was let's go have a beer and and then go home um so it's just it's, uh, that decompression side i think is so valuable um and actually sometimes putting a framework to it can actually be quite dangerous because i think everyone needs to de decompress and 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 work out what they've just been through and work out their own thoughts and feelings on it in their own way so i think there's, there's probably an element of stick some framework to it but i definitely think people are so different and people need to process in their own way. Do you find that with the international lads and ladies? Um, I think one of the things that Danny is very good at, Danny Kerry is, is, is sensing the group. So, so the D the debriefing within the group, the hockey debriefing within the group, a lot of it will be player led. So, so they will have max. They'll look at the game. Um, it might be part of the debrief is that somebody would focus on a certain part of the game, different areas of the pitch might focus on different areas of the game and they will present back to the rest of the group, which again is something that encourages this sort of psychological safety. But ultimately the responsibility, so if there are particular points that, that, that Danny wants to get across to the rest of the group, then he will lead on that or Russell Garcia or Kwan would lead on that. So it's very much about empowerment. It's very much about um, creating this environment where everybody, um, that, you know, we have a speak up culture. Everybody can speak up, you know, whether it's actually Jackson who's played three, 400 internationals or whether it's, you know, Jack Waller who's only been in the team for, for a year and has played, you know, far less. Everybody is given, is given that, that voice. And I think that's really, really important. It goes hand in hand with what we mentioned about positive communication. And I think whether you're at 15, 16 level, but giving everybody a voice and having the skill as a coach or captain to be able to facilitate that and manage that at the end of the game, particularly if things haven't gone that well, um, is a skill in itself. What about for, for you, Steph, with, with, um, with either students or with cults or with younger age groups, do you, do you see the value in, in debriefing? Do you think it's it's a positive process do you think it's needed is it required so i mean there's going to be another number of people watching this who may maybe coach at that level how how do you feel should they even try to implement this kind of debrief post game yeah absolutely um yeah i fully agree fully agree with with debriefing i think it's a case of um um rather than necessarily the like the content that goes into debriefing of oh this didn't work in our game or we need to work on this in our game it's it's more developing the skill set of as andy said developing the skill set of people who can be you know active listeners communicate really positively um and it's almost like through building their social skills in in those scenarios instead of necessarily the the um technical and tactical elements of um of hockey in that scenario and getting into good yeah, habits there it's, it's a skill debriefing is definitely a skill so i guess the positive aspect of it could be teaching youngsters how to do a debrief properly positively from from a nice early age do you, do you think that's fair or 
Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something that we try and do um, in uh, performances, uh, performance centres now as well, is that we'll, uh, uh, as Andy said, a lot of the um, uh, the feedback sessions that we give is our, our, our player led and how what their thoughts and their feelings are um, and, and sharing that with one another as well as communicating with coaches. Um, and that's something that I think is uh, is really valuable because communication is is life. You know, in, there is nowhere that you will be in in all aspects of your life where you won't be communicating with people, whether that's through nonverbal or verbal communication. So actually being able to do that properly is really valuable. And I think we're in a really valuable position as coaches and teachers um, who come into contact with young people to, to develop those skills. Um, so yeah, it's absolutely crucial in, in, in our world. Feedback, um, feedback, the ability to give feedback and take feedback is a skill in, in itself. Yeah, massively so, massively and, so. And I think the more we can develop, we that again goes really hand in hand. It's so important with creating this psychological safety where, um, yeah, so when I when I think about the word courageous conversation, um, you know, over the years, courageous conversation, I found that very difficult because of my my um, if you like my sort of profiling my 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 preferences. I'm I'm very much people driven. I like everything to be all relations, everybody to be getting on with each other. We're having good relationships. I don't like upsetting the apple cart which has meant that over the years, I found it difficult to have courageous conversations, to actually give people bad news in some ways, or um, you know, critique them around maybe a technical area where they need to improve and they need to get better. Sometimes I, I have found that difficult. So that whole feedback piece, Steph, as you've mentioned, and developing that and having the ability to have these conversations is really, really important. I think the two biggest things in 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 feedback and um, uh, and debriefing that that certainly I mean and I I have failed miserably in debriefs before and it's literally turned into you know a proper you know over over the bumper conversations that have got really heated and were really negative really negative and I think the biggest thing I learned out of that was was be compassionate in how you're talking to someone be empathetic. And try and try and listen to how you'd receive it on the other foot, and and I probably still fail miserably at this at times, still. But it's certainly if you're open to try and try engaging it from that stance, then then the conversation should be always really positive. So I think com being compassionate and being empathetic, if you can try, I know sometimes when it's hot debrief. If you can try and keep that in your mind, that then I mean, Andy, you've given me feedback before, and we've had conversations, and and I've always received it in the way it's meant, but because I think that you provided that empathetically, compassionately, and understanding the reasons for certain actions. So I think I've been that, doing it some years, Joel, I guess, but and maybe you're you're like Yoda, you know, you're just a master at, at, at <laughs> delivering shit news. Excuse my language. It's it's interesting, actually. I don't know whether anybody watching this or people have have watched. There's a very different approach to BBC Breakfast at the moment or ITV. And Piers Morgan has been absolutely laying into MPs, representatives from the government. And if you watch that, I, I just wonder. So one of the one of the big qualities we've all spoken about, I know I heard it mentioned last week, was humility. And I wonder if somebody turned around to Piers Morgan and said, yep. Sorry, we've got that wrong. He would just be, and it, it, it's really interesting, all right, because that that it's it's almost like this this sort of feedback jousting that seems to be going on at the moment. But but no, sorry, I'm I'm off track a bit here. But I do I do think feedback, the ability to give and take in the right way, it promotes psychological safety within the team. And it also will help us learn from the experience that we've just had. Hmm. Well, that was interesting. That was interesting, definitely. Right. On to the next question then. What sport, in your opinion, strengthens your mental robustness in mindset? Like a like which sport? In yeah, you could pick a sport and say, right, the majority of people that come out of that sport are mentally really robust. I mean. <laughs> I'm going to be like uh, throw be a bit of a devil's advocate. Like, when when do you become mentally robust? 
because at what point do you think oh yes I've achieved it I am mentally robust I don't I don't think that that is necessarily um a, a label that you can give people I think people get better at dealing with experiences the more that they have um and they might show traits of robustness um but I don't think you can say right go and play rugby you'll come out a mentally robust person or go and play hockey you'll come out a mentally robust person you could have people that have played no sport before in their life and they'll be really mentally robust um sport I think in you know I'm a PE teacher so I'm arguably biased to it but definitely helps but I don't think that you can say any one thing will make you mentally interesting robust. that I think the person to ask at the moment is probably Sam Ward because I think he's done 37 different isolation <laughs> yeah. Olympic sports Which one made him more on social media so he'll be able to answer that question um, <laughs> what is the most mentally robust human being on the planet planet currently in lockdown <laughs> <laughs> it's it, you know it's a real interesting one I think um so so part of me is saying being part of a team it's almost as if there's a little bit of room for error so if you have an off day if you mentally your robustness if you have a bit of an off day everybody else will sort of cover for you so if you're in an individual sport there is no hiding place I mean I think I always think back to um Rory McIlroy uh, in Augusta and think you know when he blew that was it a, an eight shot lead and you think mental robustness for sport prepared being prepared mentally for sport millions of people are watching him um is he th th as a golfer as an international golfer does that make you more robust if you are in an individual sport or if you are in a team sport and then i'm thinking what about our decathletes there may be some people on here that might remember Daley Thompson. I'm not sure. We're going back quite some years. He, he I remember him. So decathlete, it's about 10 disciplines over a weekend. Um, it, <laughs> I'm a little bit with you, Steph, in that I think there's a difference between being resilient and being mentally tough. I think mental toughness is almost like that's a block. It's a block of concrete. Um, and some people are much tougher mentally than others. I think resilience, you, you build your ability to be resilient. Um, and I think both are really important qualities you know, within sports. So being resilient, you've got the ups, the downs, and it's the ability to understand that you're going to hit both and the ability to be able to cope with both. Um, can I be a bit controversial here? So a football player, international football player, would you class that, and I'm not, I'm not saying they are or they're not, but would you say that they are mentally robust? And if you compared, um, uh, I don't know, um, uh, pick a football player. Steph, you're a footy fan. Name any football player. Raheem Sterling. Okay, Raheem Sterling. <laughs> he has mentally robust as Nimal, who's just done 14 of the highest peaks in, in the world. And this is where I was saying, you know, I don't, it, it's difficult because it's, you're, you know, you can't, I don't feel like you can compare two people in terms of like level of robustness. Like, I mean, there's, there's obviously a lot of academic study and, and books and stuff like that out there on this. Um, you know, arguably you could say that a footballer's experience of get, getting to the top, very top level is very up and down and there'll be peaks and troughs in there, you know, some at the, whether it's like to do with their personal lives and their upbringing or whether it's being you know brought into academies dropped out of academies picked up again you know being given a sponsorship deals or dropped or you know all of the all of the as Andy said the peaks and troughs that happen with elite sport um that you know his environment of football and then the environment of as you say climbing was it eight peaks in however many months. Was it 14? Was it 14? 14, 14 8,000 metre peaks in six months. Okay, so I got all of those numbers wrong. Um, but yeah, so, you know, that's, that. I, I don't feel, feel like those two things are comparable other than the fact that one of them is a challenge for one person and the other one is a challenge for that person. So what is that footballer's Everest? So, so back, whereas the other person, his Everest is actually Everest. So going back to Sarah's question, what sport, in your opinion, strengthens your mental robustness <laughs> most? 
is that is the answer to that you can't you can't pick one like you you no i can't pick one just go and play sport it's good for you i think different <laughs> qualities i think you've yeah. summed it up well there joel you're speaking about different pastimes different qualities being mentally tough being resilient those are the two qualities that you need in spades really for 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 any high pressured event to get through any high yeah. pressure okay next question from matthew corbin uh how do you deal with a teammate that that damages your team morale and values i guess we've touched on this already haven't we when we spoke about um we go back to my my um brilliant diagram here from the um you know, so we have somebody whose attitude is and what we've spoken about is is first of all as a coach uh, manager teacher leader parent whatever whatever you are initially taking a bit of responsibility to try and sort that situation out yourself courageous conversations with that individual when when yeah so so say you're you're in the middle of a game a player has a complete red brain moment really losing his plot when is it you should have that that courageous conversation with that player so my i guess my view on that would be that if if this is having a detrimental negative impact at the time on the team you would have to take some action then now quite often a long spell on the bench can have that effect because you get the opportunity maybe to calm down but i still think that the the, the strength of this is 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 in around the ability of this is having the right conversations at the right times in the right way so i go back to this effective communication thing it might be that you go with it you go with it for the game but then on a one to one you then have that conversation afterwards i don't think you can you can necessarily predict joel that that any one specific uh, action is going to remedy that situation. I don't know what you think, Steph. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with you there. I think things work best for different people. Um, and I think how you manage that is going to be, is based on how well you know your players. Um, you know, it might just be that they're getting caught up in that kind of red brain moment, in the heat of the moment in the game. They just need to have five minutes, get some water on board and just maybe have an arm around the back and be like, chill, like this is going to work out. We just need to, you know, get through this part of the game. Um, likewise, at the same time, people might take, take that of taking five minutes on the bench as a negative thing. Um, so maybe, yeah, getting to know your players is probably the best way that you're going to be able to deal with those situations. I've, I've seen it done both ways, Joel. I've, I've, you know, I've seen international coaches um, in the moment really in a, in a command and control, point the finger and read the riot act. I've seen that, but I've also seen nothing done at the time deliberately and it actually acted on a little bit later on. So I, I, again, I think both ways can work. I think, I think Steph, like that point there is, is absolutely poignant is when you know the person or know the player, you know how to have a positive influence whether it is command and control in your face or whether it is literally nothing you know which one's gonna have the impact i mean bigsy won't mind me saying this there's been times when bigsy's had real moments and i i knew that literally just making no eye contact with him was probably more impactive than me standing there and and, and giving him the right act yeah, I mean, that's that's absolutely something that, you know, um, the teachers that are out there watching, you know, how we behaviour manage um, players and, and, and pupils, should I say, um, you know, sometimes you don't need to say anything. Mm. You know, sometimes it is, you know, you can you can look or not engage with that behaviour um, and not give the um, kind of uh, attention that potentially that person is, is looking for by acting up or behaving in that certain way. Um, you know that can be a really effective way of beha behavior management behavior managing that person at that time the same could go for a, for an adult side 
is that actually if I engage with this person right now what am I going to get into here am I going to get into you know a shouting match is it going to be that actually they're not in the right frame of mind to be able to take feedback at that time um, and as it goes back to that you know the skill of, of, of giving and receiving feedback if that person's not in the right place to take feedback at that time then I'm going to get nowhere if I start dishing it out um, no, it's, it's so it's really, being able to read the room it's, it's, it's really, really the astrophor, whatever you know is is going to be vital there it's also really interesting from an angle of it, it, that's a very hard position you're put in there as a coach as a, a manager or whatever because not only are you balancing that person and the impact of that person in that moment, you're also balancing, well, what if the rest of the team see this? And what if they see me doing or saying nothing? Is that, do they receive a message then of, um, uh, uh, am I condoning that behavior? So it, it's, it's a, that, that, and I guess as a, as a player who's probably at times done that, I certainly in those moments didn't think or he even didn't realize till recently the impact that that could have on the coaches, the manager and the rest of the players, because you know, that the, 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 the unspoken message that could also be portrayed by not doing anything or saying anything could also be quite damaging, I guess. Yeah, I think it can. Again, that comes back to how well you know your players and how well your players know you. So I think um, if, if you didn't do anything about it, it wouldn't necessarily. So I, I, I would like to think that if some sort of behavior took place in front of me and I didn't do anything about it, that my athletes or the players or the people I was working with, because they know me, they would not automatically think, look, he's not doing anything about it. Yeah. It would be that there's a certain way. I think the other thing that we haven't mentioned that's important with this is about what about that player? It might be the coach. It might be you that's the problem. Mm. What about the player? So the player taking a bit of responsibility for, for his own action. He might not even realise how he's coming across. I mean, I had this, this situation a few years ago when I was coaching at St Albans where I got so emotion, emotionally involved in the game and the more emotionally involved I got, the more my eyes started to stick out of my head and I'd look like a, an enraged pilchard halfway through the second half and I never realized and players so you know they'd see this automatically think look here is this really angry coach and it wasn't until I saw myself on video and realized what I looked like that actually I, I changed my behavior a little yeah. bit um, so I think I think it's that's important I think I think getting the player to take try and take some responsibility for their actions to you know how, how for them to understand how they're impacting on the rest of the group is is we shouldn't rule that out that's got to be part of the process i mean one, one thing you've hit on there that i think is really interesting uh, tom hudson is saying that that was scary oh hello tom, <laughs> Hi, tom. <laughs> sorry tom <laughs> And one thing that, that you've just hit on there that I think is actually, again, certainly wasn't in my thought process was for, for, for us to always understand the players, but also for the players to understand the coaches and the manager and, 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 and trust in the fact that that wasn't, um, that wasn't missed and that is going to be addressed. I'm just dealing with it in the best way for right now. I, I think that's a, yeah, gold dust. Yeah. Um, we've had a couple of questions here. Um, Mary Westlake, uh, how would you approach developing juniors out of the stage where they blame themselves for a game result? Um, I think that's really, it's really difficult. Um, it's, it, and it, I wouldn't say that I have an answer for that. Um, it is difficult because um, kids are competitive and um, you know they want to do well. They want to see success. Um, and we are in a uh, a culture of sport where everybody is obsessed by results. Um, and so, um, this is something that um, we work with, especially in the in, in the performance centres, with with parents as well, of actually getting them to understand that at the end of the day, we're not fussed about the result that happens in there in in the games that we play there. Um, it's about what's developing. Uh, what's developing for that person for that individual and as a collective group 
Um, so, you know, I think it, it takes a little bit, it takes time as well, is, is that you've got to invest a little bit of time into it. But having the opportunity to speak with your players, either as collectives or as individuals, and um, this is something that I've really worked on over the past couple of years um, in, my, in my head of hockey role, is that actually if we can agree as a group on like two or three things that we're really going to focus on in that game um, and, and have them as almost like process, process goals of like, I don't know, we're going to try and get to however many circle entries or we're going to try and win the ball back higher up the pitch or whatever it might be. Um, and then I would make a note of that on a whiteboard and, and do a little bit of like a notational analysis on the side of the pitch so that actually then when they come off, irrespective of what the what the um, result is at that time whether it's a win or loss or draw there is still some tangible evidence of success that they can they can grab hold of there um, and you know you can do that on an individual basis as well um, uh, especially with you know the fact that video and stuff like that is is more common nowadays um, and if you have the opportunity to use it then I would um, so yeah so it, it, it's a challenge it's a massive challenge because Kids want to do well, they want to win, um, you know, they want to be competitive and they want to feel success. Um, so it's just maybe tailoring what that su success looks like to that individual might be um, might be a good way to to start taking the kind of um, the heat away from winning at times. Cool. Okay. I think an early uh, introduction to sports psychology, um, just understanding very simple concepts around how the brain works how we focus, how it, you know, the cortisol that, 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 um, that sort of floods us and, and gets us into negativity and threat. Um, and just understanding how that works and how important it is to be able to focus on, you know, those positive things that the, the clear blue thinking that we speak about. So when we, when we recognize these red brain, red brain reactions for, for those that have read the chimp paradox, which I'm sure many people have done, you know, that chimp that sits on your shoulder. It's, it's, it's defined in many, many different ways, but I think an er just an early understanding of, of how you can be hijacked by emotion. Um, I, I think is, is, I'm not an expert. I've never taught, you know, youngsters, young kids and never taught in schools, but I'm, I'm quite staggered sometimes about, uh, you know, when you meet young players that sort of come into that, the, the international squads, the age group squads, 18, 21 level, and they've had very little input on sports psychology. I know some schools now within, um, I think, A-level PE, it's part of it, yeah. but I think we could do more with that. Yeah, 100%. Um, it's something that um, it, it is becoming more talked about at a kind of in a performance centre environment anyway. Um, but we have to remember as well as coaches that and and especially those with those young people, um, they don't have fully formed emotional intelligent brains like arguably adults have um, and they de and brains develop at a very different rate to what our, our physical maturity does. Um, so you could have somebody who is 15 years old, uh, a very physically mature person, but actually still um, has, a, has a, a brain age, shall we say, of a few years younger. So I think that's really Im important to remember is that actually those emotional responses are gonna happen and it's okay for them to happen as long as we can kind of try and guide our, our, our people through that and get them to, as Andy said, have a little bit more understanding about what's going on there. And also celebrate the mistakes that happen. You know, it's okay. But as practical advice, I mean, that, that's all great information. As practical advice to the people watching, what would you tell them to start? Would you tell them to ask their club to bring in someone to talk about that? Would you ask the, the club to fund them going through some kind of course? What practical advice would you give them to implement in their space? Um, in terms of practical advice, I would say if you can, if you have the opportunity to do a bit of reading around it yourself, then, then do it because it's all well and good getting somebody to come in once for an hour to chat away. How much is that is that kid going to get away uh, away from that? Probably not a huge amount. It's about the drip feeding the information there. So if you can do a bit of reading um, around that, you know, chimp paradox is a good a good place to start with that. Um, but also then, as a, as a coach, get into really good practices of uh, of celebrating mistakes um and actually identifying the fact right because we've, we've because we've made this mistake here and we've been able to talk about it and, and come up with a solution we're now at this point you know you can kind of 
show the process that they've gone through um, rather than, you know, focusing solely on the on the bad thing or the negative thing that's happened um, and try and put it in a, those mistakes that happen in a really positive way. Uh, and then also put some focus on, as I say, some uh, targets being set or goals that are set within games, within competitive situations. Um, so that the emphasis isn't just all on on winning so that people really do. And this goes for adults as well. So people can have something tangible that they can say, I did really well at that today, irrespective of whether you won or lost. Cool. OK, good answer. I like it. Um, Andy, one for you. Uh, Mark Stewart Thompson. Uh, and he's actually got one for you as well, Steph. So there's two questions. Um, Andy, how does Andy manage to stay focused on his team manager role when the England slash GB team is not doing as not going as planned? Um, where's it gone? Not going as planned, or things are going, or, or things are not going very well at an important fixture. So that's the one to um, to Andy. And then we'll jump on to Steph's one next. So um, we all have responsibilities as, um, as a staff team. Uh, we all have responsibilities. So on a match day, there's quite a lot that goes on around preparation. Uh, most of the, uh, the, 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 the sort of tactical prep uh, will, have, will have happened beforehand. But, but there are, I, so my role on a match day, um, I, I, I can be fa fairly busy. Probably the most important role for me is uh, is being on the bench and doing the substitutions. So I would probably do up to 60 substitutions. And you will see me on the sideline at Lee Valley with my Reggie Cray glasses and my iPad in front of me. And I am I am running the substitutions. Now, I have got to stay tuned into that. Um, if I take my eye off the ball because things aren't going that well, then we are going to end up with maybe 12 players on the pitch, maybe <laughs> 10 players on the pitch. And it hasn't happened before, has it? Really? Both Ooh, have happened, yes. Um, Where, when? I've heard, I've heard this story. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> so the uh, the 12 on the pitch was was an interesting one. And we have to talk about that before we get in trouble. Well, yeah, no, no, we can talk about it. It's, right. it's all out in the... Um, so the three, there's three... I've had three bad experiences of, of having my eye a little bit off the ball. Uh, and in fact, that question is quite um, poignant with this particular scenario because it was against the uh, Australia in The Hague in the World Cup 2014. And we, I think, were gone two or three goals down. We weren't doing very well. And the World Cup at The Hague was on a football pitch. So the benches were quite away from, and unbeknown to me, one of our players, who I, I won't mention, had stepped off the pitch further away from the bench and I hadn't seen it. And in fact, what had happened is we'd effectively taken two players off and put one player on and I hadn't seen. And there was a, a message came from somebody sitting up in the stand saying, have we had somebody sent off and I'm starting. To... So um, yeah, we ended up, we played you know, Australia, tough team to play against. We ended up playing against them for several minutes with only 10 on the pitch. So that's, so that's, that's one. Um, the other one uh, I think was when um, Argentina actually had 12 on against us, which, which we sort of spotted. Um, Punishment. And, that ended up in the world that was in the world cup as well in the hague where it was playing off for the bronze medal we ended up i think losing 2-1 or 1-0 2-1 i think um <clears throat> and there was a process that we went through did it influence the game and and you know there was an appeal it ended up with the result stayed um as it as it was so that happened probably the worst one for me as a manager taking my off the ball was when uh, at the Olympic Games test event in 2012, where I became infamous, believe it or not, on BBC Breakfast, um, where we, the, the changing, so it's a test event. It was, a, a, and I say that, a test event. So we're trying things out. The changing rooms were quite a long walk from the pitch. So I asked the officials if they could give us a knock on the door when there were three minutes left of half time. 
Jason Lee, Team Talk, Rabbited On, Knock On The Door, unbeknown to me, that was the two minute knock, not the three minute knock. So at the beginning of the second half, we had eight players on the pitch and Germany started with their 11 and scored. Um, and that was replayed on BBC Breakfast. Now, unfortunately, the um, it, it, it rolls uphill, doesn't it? And it, it ended up, who, whose responsibility was it? Everybody's asking lots of questions. It was me. So the team were on the pitch late. So, <laughs> so in answer to the question, when things, I have to stay tuned in. I've got to stay switched on mentally. I've got to focus on what I'm doing because there's quite a lot going on on these days and you know having players on the pitch with the wrong shirt on having too many players on the beginning of a quarter you know all these sorts of things you've got to be really on it and you've got to concentrate so I just carry on in answer to that question which is you know when things are not going well I just carry on doing my job and I think the other thing that comes from that is if I start to get emotional when we're losing, what message does that send to the rest of the group if I start getting involved? So I am the proverbial swan with my head above the water, even if my legs are going to the dozen underneath, I remain calm. How long did it take you to get to that point where you're not um, panicking? In that moment, how long? How 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 long was did it take to be until you got to the point where you were really comfortable in that space under that level of pressure where you've just sent eight people out to play against Germany? <laughs> Your head. What were you thinking in that moment? <laughs> uh, I was actually running towards the bench myself to get your stick and get on and play. <laughs> I think by the time I got to the bench, the Germans were in our circle. That was how bad it was. Fighting tackle. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting now. I mean, you learn your lesson from these things. And, um, you know, that, that was, I know we spoke earlier about error. That was an error for which I took responsibility. And we, and we learned from it. And we made sure that it didn't happen again. We've now got it off to a fairly fine T. So if, if, if Danny is still chatting and we get to that two minute mark, he will probably hear me go, two minutes, Danny. <laughs> in in the changing room um and we and we and you'll notice also i have a board so i use a tactics board and whoever is starting the next quarter is written on the board we did that at bromsgrove do you remember no old seals you remember and you, you draw the the pictures of everyone rather than their names very good always sticks um uh cool excellent okay next question um from a psychological perspective, what is the biggest threat to a team? I, I think I think poor communication skills within the group, the inability to have courageous conversations, the inability to communicate with each other, give honest feedback, um, and a blame culture. I think if you start having a blame culture, you start to get cliques yeah. within the team. And when you start to get cliques, you, you know, you're on a little bit of a, a downward spiral. Um, so you, for me, nipping that type of behavior in the bud is really, really important. Very good. Steph, anything to follow up on that? No, I would, uh, I'd agree with that. I think um, as soon as poor relationships start to, to occur within, within a group, it can be really difficult to salvage that. Um, so yeah, it's just getting, making sure that, um, everybody understands and, and is well-versed in that positive communication. Excellent. Um, Mark Stuart Thompson's Andy is saying Italy versus Poland at the Euros, apparently 12 on the pitch. Oh. Mark seems to know his stuff. It, ha um, it does happen a lot, actually. I'm surprised <laughs> it doesn't happen more. Um, Commonwealth, very quickly, Joel, Commonwealth Games, um, Australia versus England and Australia ended up with 12 on the pitch and if that happens um, the captain gets a yellow card. Oh right. So what happened well captain 
um, got a yellow card, but of course they still had 11 on the pitch. <laughs> and, the, and the game restarted. So um, I am frantically waving my arms and with my big bulbous pilchard eyes in front of the uh, technical desk saying, they've still got 11 on the pitch, it should be 10. Because originally they had 12 and they've only taken one off. <laughs> Those sorts of things happen quite a bit in international oh, hockey. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no blaming. <laughs> oh, interesting. So we've got a question here from uh, Adam Mills. Um, hello, team. Great to see you all. Hi, Adam. Um, how would you manage a squad of largely introverted players, uh, not enough chiefs? What advice could you give to change a culture of silence? I would take um, a bit of time there, I think, in trying to take them maybe out of a, uh, a hockey environment and try and get them in an environment where maybe they're all on the same kind of level. So like some kind of activity of some sort um, that, that is taking them out of that potentially uh, competitive, pressurised environment um, and, and go and do, a, do an activity of a different sort where you can that, that group can try and start to form friendships and relationships there. Um, so then hopefully then when you come back into a more competitive, more pressurized environment that they feel a little bit more comfortable in, in talking because they've got a bit of experience of, of how the others are. I don't know, Andy, if you suggest anything. Else. Yeah, I think it's, that's quite a difficult one because what tends to go a little bit with that is the fact that you lack a bit of an edge so, so sometimes, and we've, we've spoken earlier about having players that don't sort of quite fit the mould and maybe their attitude is not quite right. Sometimes you need those sorts of people in a team because you give you, it gives you that added edge and that fire that you need and they can fire others up. I'd be tempted in that situation to try and create a leadership group. Maybe three, within that group, yeah. Give, give three or four, pick three or four um of your maybe more vocal players or players that have an influence on the rest and give them some more responsibility and really encourage that responsibility. So, um, so it, it, you put them in a position where they've actually just got to take a bit of responsibility on the pitch. It might be for a little bit of a debrief in training. It might be to arrange a social event. It might be. So, so giving people that sort of responsibility that draws, that draws them out. Um, I think would be the first step for me. Can I, can I lead on from that question and say, and ask, sorry, as a question, um, what, what age would you start creating leadership, leadership groups within, within teams? Do you, do you, uh, you know, do you start as early as possible under sevens, under eights, under nines, or would you say like teens or late cults? Like where, where do you start? Cause I mean, that's such a valuable um asset a, te a leadership team it's also you've got to learn how to work with a leadership team you've also got to work how you've got to learn how to be in a leadership team so when do you start that process i think that's um it's a good question i think um there is opportunity for leadership roles from young ages um you know from from primary school ages where where, where we're playing any form of Kind of competitive sport we can give leadership responsibilities there and you know those leadership responsibilities obviously scale based on, on on age there whether it is you know maybe you have somebody who's responsible for bringing the bringing the kit out helping with the kit out the car or maybe you have somebody who's responsible who's good at numbers or something like that right can you split the groups into three groups of five for me what are you know those kind of things where you you take and give a little bit of responsibility there. I think it's really important, however, at a young age to give as much opportunity to as many people there so that they can develop their leadership skills. Because the problem is that if you start giving that to uh, that, you know, create a leadership group in a group of say under 12s, under 13s, we have clicks forming there. And that's, and, and, and I go back to this kind of emotional brain development there. They, people's kids won't be able to see that actually what we're doing here is developing leaders and, and, and developing um, a group and, you know, a, a, a good team culture. Um, it doesn't work in that way. They'll see that as, oh, they're the favourites. 
um, or you know, they're 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 the better players. They're they're the better people in this group. Why haven't I been given that opportunity? And that's that's a really dangerous place to get into. Um, so I think you what you can do is you, you know you can you can say give different responsibilities out to players. But I think at a younger age group, it's really important to give the opportunity, as Andy said, to have that you know everyone has a speak up um, opportunity, um, opposed to have necessarily having um a, an out and out leadership group as such um and i think as you people get older people will form naturally into those kind of leadership roles anyway within the pitch without necessarily having the label of captain or vice captain or whatever um and that's maybe when you can make things a little bit more formal as people get a little bit older i think i think that leads nicely into uh, the question that came in before uh, we we started trying to go live um was about about parents so so in 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 still on the topic of psychological well-being um how do we cre ensure that um parents who want the best for their kids don't encroach on that how, how do we make sure that that i guess the professionals either the coaches and the clubs are left to ensure they implement their strategy their coaching their decision making without the encroachment of, of um, a very positive parent. Yeah, I mean, it's a challenge that I think all teachers or coaches will will experience at some point. Um, and um, I'm not saying that I definitely don't have all the answers to that. And I've got a, a reasonable amount of experience in it. But, you know, I've probably, probably still got quite a, learned, a lot to learn in this kind of area. But for me, I think um, a, a, a huge thing that you can show as a coach is, is humility. Um, and this is what I was saying earlier um, and, and last week, is that if I, uh, and, and transparency as well. Um, and, you know, one of the more positive things that I've done um, in, in my coaching roles, especially with where parents are on the side of the pitch, uh, watching training, watching your games, you know, they, they will make a point of coming to speak to you before, after, um, is being transparent and actually, you know, letting them in on the process of, of coaching um, and what their what their child is going through, because um, the the experience of hockey and the experience of training and the game doesn't end just because they've left. I mean, I'm sure you guys have experienced it as well, and the majority of people here watching tonight. How many dinner time conversations have you had where you're having a debrief with your parents or whoever's at home about what's happened in training or what's happened in, in games? So it's something that we really try to work on in our performance center is actually getting parents to buy into what we're doing um, within our sessions because you know some of them probably do look, look a little bit odd. How do you do that? On the outside looking in. So just sharing what we're doing. At the end of the day, we are all fighting the same battle of wanting our, our young people to develop as people and as, as, as hockey players to be as, as successful as they can. So parents are a really valuable resource there and families are a really valuable resource there. And we almost cut our nose off to spite our face by not involving them more. So how, how do you actually do that? So that, that's the objective, which is a really key objective, but how, certainly learning from your performance center experience as a coach there, how would you advise a club or a coach to to actually do that with parents who are seemingly really yeah I mean, we so we've done it we've had uh, information evenings where we've sat and sat and had um like a, a, a presentation or whatever about what we're doing and what our sessions look like what our objectives are how we communicate with our players and things like that um we've invited them onto the pitch so they can come onto the pitch and and providing that they're standing a safe place you know come in come and ask ask about what's going on come in and ask the players about what's going on we've had feedback sessions on a pitch as well where we've asked the parents to come and join us and say right this is our reflective time at the end of the session we're having deep like a, a debrief as such with with the group um they go off into small groups as well please dive in go and have conversations ask uh, find out what you want to know um and then we for that so do you do that up to a certain age group? Is that is that effective up to a certain age group? Is I mean, it... so we, we do this with under 15 and under 17. So, you know, they're they're, they're more mature girls um, that we do that we do this with. Um, but I don't think that there's um I think again it goes back to knowing knowing the people around you um and, and what kind of impact that they can have. I think 
you can absolutely do um, presentations or Q and A's or things like this um, with with parents at any age. Um, I think the more that they understand, the more knowledge they have. Knowledge is power. Then they can understand what's going on, and you're probably going to have more positive interactions with them, um, opposed to negative ones, if they know what's going on. Um, so yeah, but I think parent, like uh, people see parents as these like big and families as these big scary entities, and it's me coach, me teacher, them parents keep them really far away, and I stay over here with the kids. You know, it doesn't need to be like that. Um, we want the best for our players, they want the best for their kids. Um, and it's about finding a, a happy medium in the middle. So don't don't be afraid of them. Go, they are humans, go and have a conversation with them. Um, it's also out. an element as a parent to make sure that you're, you're managing yourself in that process as well. I think that's- 100%, yeah, 100%. Um, and, and that's where, that's where if, if providing you as a coach, you know, you're doing this, having these positive communication with them active listening all of that kind of stuff if you put yourself in the best possible place to communicate with those parents you know then then what more can you do you can't, you can't so, do so if little jimmy's mum or dad really thinks that little jimmy should be playing on saturday and they approach you and and they're like steph i really think little jimmy should be playing on saturday in as center forward rather than left back what what's your response Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, it's a conversation I've had before. Um, my uh, general, well, I try, I try and avoid this conversation by preempting it, if I'm honest, by having these conversations earlier in the year or uh, earlier within the training cycle of saying that at this age group, we're, we're working on becoming good hockey players, not you working at becoming a good left forward, you working on bec becoming a good centre half. Um, it, we're working to develop well-rounded players um, so therefore you will have times where you're playing out of position and we tell the players about that and uh, tell the parents about that so then hopefully that conversation doesn't need to happen um, when it does inevitably happen sometimes and I go and I kind of fall back on that and say look we've we've agreed this as a, a, a as a um, a coaching strategy shall we say um, and um, we've spoken, the players are well informed about this. We've yeah. spoken about it previously. Sounds like the underlining message there, as, as ever, which has been a key part throughout this entire chat tonight, is communication. Just Yeah, really I mean, really well, there is no reason to hide. Why do we need to hide any of that information? I'd, I'd be surprised if people, there was any intent to it. They probably didn't realise that there was a need to share that. Yeah. Uh, more than anything. Yeah. But I think, as ever, it's sounding like, exactly the same as last week in relation to culture if a team communicates well every a lot of other things fall into place that seems to be yeah. um cool okay next question we've got a couple more before we finish up um andy how hard as a coach do you try and pull high ability players to become more of a team player without losing their ability to change a game sorry joel say that again <laughs> How how hard as a coach? Uh, how hard as a coach do you try and pull high ability players yep. to become more of a team player without losing their ability to change the game? So, in essence, um, how hard should you try and um, make a top end player become more a team player? Should you be working really hard at that to bring them more aligned to the team, or should you just be, you know? Yeah, I get it. Um... I think I think the first thing we have to understand is that everybody is different, um, and certainly the, the teams that I've coached. Um, I guess my my sort of police upbringing was was always look my way is the best way, um, you know conform to my way, um, or I'm not interested. And, and I and I think it took me quite a long time to get out of that mindset. Um, and certainly in coaching, the first thing is that 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 understanding that you know we we're, we're all different. So. So having an understanding of that individual and, you know, what are his preferences? What are his traits? What, what is it about him? So my first, um, my first, I guess, tactic with that would be to have a really good conversation with him and try and get to a point to try and work out, you know, what makes him tick? What's his why? Why is he playing? Is there something in the background that may be preventing him from being a team player 
has he had a bad experience? Is there something there that is, is restricting him mixing with others? Is there a personality clash within the team? So I think, first of all, you know, a little bit of groundwork. I think it is really important to try and try and create that. But I'm also a sort of believer in, in, in generally, as, as far as the majority of behaviours are concerned, leopards don't change their spots. So I think you've got to try and mould the best you can that person to fit in with the rest of the group. But I also think it's important that the rest of the group recognise that. And it's a 50-50 thing. So they try and work to get this player involved in, um, in, what, in what the group does. The other thing I think is really important is that I think role modelling certain um, areas of this star player to the rest of the group is actually really important. So if it is... Um, the fact that maybe they're a brilliant corner flicker, or they might be a fantastic number one runner at corners. They might do something that really benefits the rest of the team. Then I, I would actually really um, encourage to talk about that sort of thing, to make them feel that they are valued you know, within, within the setup. So rather than just, um, yeah, not part of the group, don't want to become part of the group, I think you've really got to smoke, blow a, a bit of smoke up um, and and really, you know, cajole, nurture, um, to do your very best to get that person more and more involved within the group. Um, some of the great feedback you get is player to player. If you can get to that point where rather than coach feedback, you know, when I hear some players telling other players on the pitch how well they've done, giving them both you know, some good feedback, but also some honest feedback, let's say, and it's received well, you think you know, that's, that's a good relationship we've got there. Um, and I think, it I think takes been, a long time to get there. Yeah, I, I think, and again, it's, it, that's definitely a two-way thing. It takes two people to be on the right, right, right wave there to receive that information and give that information. And I think, I, think I, I, I totally agree with that. When, you, when you've got that click, then a lot of stuff within that team will work really nicely. And really, and really emphasise their super strengths. So everybody has super strengths within the organisation. So to make them feel better about themselves, really emphasise that super strength, um, particularly in front of you know other other players. Cool, excellent. Uh, Steph, anything you'd like to add, or are you happy to move on? No, let's let's move on. I thought what, we've got one, maybe one more. Yeah. Uh, game day, do you conduct yourself in a certain way to help others psychologically? Yeah. Go on then, Steph. Yeah, I definitely, yeah, I definitely do. I mean, I, I, I um, as a, as a player, not to a particularly good standard, but as a player, I've been on the receiving end of potentially that angry, pilchard looking coach. Um, and uh, for me, you know, it's part of the reason why I got into coaching is that I um, didn't enjoy being around that and I, I didn't get anything out of that and actually really put me off playing for quite quite a chunk of time. Um, so that was like, I was like, I, you know, I don't want people to experience this, so I'm going to go and be a coach and try not to be like that. Um, and, and I think the thing is about a game day is that it can be highly emotional for so many different people on, on a pitch. It doesn't need your kind of uncontrolled emotion adding to that situation as well. What we need to be is that kind of blue minded, really calm and have clarity over a situation so that we can support players that maybe aren't as blue minded and calm and, and have as much clarity as we do um, in, the, in those situations. That's not necessarily to say that you stand there and you know, you're a closed book and, uh, and, and you show no emotion within that. Um, but I think it's uh, the emotion that you show needs to be um, kind of quite careful in the sense of like, you know, celebrate the good things, celebrate, um, you know, when people are trying new things and, and, and stuff like that, you know, give them an arm around the shoulder when maybe it hasn't worked or, or whatever. Um, but I think when we get to that point where maybe things aren't going right in the game, if we then jump on that bandwagon as well, it can all go south very, very quickly. 
um, and we end up probably pulling people into that as well, um, which then ends up being a really negative negative place. Um, so I think if we, you know, I would say I would definitely say that I change the or uh, go in a little bit more um, aware of how I am on on game day. I don't know about you, Andy. So uh, it's an interesting question that, and um, I think if I think about my role and what I'm there to do for the team, so so my role is to to try and maintain a performance environment. So the athletes can perform to their ability. That's my role. So if I if I have that in the back of my mind all the time, that certainly will affect my behaviour. So so thinking about examples, and I, I guess I learned the hard way. Um, we played India in the semi-finals of the Commonwealth Games in Delhi in 2010, uh, and it went to a penalty shootout, but it was a penalty flick shootout rather than eight seconds. Um, and there was an allegation, an inference that the Indian team were drag, dragging the ball and then flicking. Um, and some of our players were getting very irate with the umpires, with the umpire manager. And so was the manager. So I was getting quite, and, and actually it made me, I sat back, I came away from that thinking, you know, you, you've really got to be, uh, sit in the middle here, be a peacekeeper and remain calm. So. If, if a lot is going on around you, you've got to be the one that is calm. And I think, I, so I learned from that. So, so now my um, tournaments that I go to, I think it's really important that whatever is happening around me and within the team, that I am able to be, if you like, the conduit between the officials, the umpires, everything else that's going on and the group. And that's the staff group and the athlete group. Now, in order for me to be that way, I've got to remain calm. Great example. Um, we were in EPO for the Sultan Aslan Shah Cup. Uh, the games over there start at four o'clock, six o'clock, eight o'clock. What happens in EPO? Half past three every day, electrical storms. So we get an absolute downpour and the game ends up being put back. So we get the rule book out, we work out how many minutes we've got to wait for the, the uh, lightning to have gone. Then we've got to wait another 25 minutes. So there is this real air of uncertainty. Um, now, we, we had a very young squad there one particular year and we had a lightning delay. So we didn't even start the game. We got across to the benches and then straight off. The lads like to play a bit of corridor cricket or well, they like to play a bit of football, they take a football with them. Um, and I'm with the sort of the tournament officials trying to work out when this game's going to be started. And I hear this almighty sound of smashing glass. And the lads have just kicking a football around and they have smashed this massive plate glass window. And we've got the police coming into the changing room. We've got glass everywhere. We've got the lads standing there with the sort of the tails between their backsides, looking at me, uh, wondering help, help. <laughs> exactly if my eyes are going to come out like pilchards. Now, if you have that, in, I've, I've got to just stay calm there. This, you know, these things just happen. Yeah, don't worry, fellas. We'll clear up the glass. Don't worry. We just so there's a situation where probably the red brain side of me would want to react. Um, but actually that's, that's not the way I am. I stay calm because if I do react that way, that's going to influence the performance at the end of the day. It's going to influence the, the sort of mental state, if you like, the cognitive state of the players, if I start going off on one. So I'm very aware of how I'm seen and how my behavior comes across within the group. So I see it really important. I respect everybody, whether they are staff whether they are athletes everybody has a different way that they get themselves mentally prepared on game day and i fully respect that so if if, if george penner wants to tell me five or six jokes an hour before the game he does that and i laugh and other people will go off with headphones so it's really about not upsetting the equilibrium and just being able to cope with the things when they happen 
So we're half an hour before the start and I get a tap on the shoulder and somebody says, I've left my shirt at the hotel. So that's the sort of, so you can imagine the sort of red brain reaction that you get, but actually it's okay, bang, let's look for a solution. So we don't worry about the problem, where's the solution? And I think the way that you portray yourself through those sorts of situations as, as being reliable um, and just like Steph has said, you know, you just, you, 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 you are calm all the way through this. Do you think that some of that is, is relative to your role there? So on your, your responsibility and your role is this, Danny Kerry's role responsibility is this, the medical staff's responsibility is this. So you've all got your own yep. individual areas of responsibility. And, and I guess to a certain extent, it's for Danny to worry about the coaching side. It's the medical to worry about the medical side. So with that complete clearance of, of you know, you've got the mental capacity there to really completely solely focus on your role as Andy Halliday and manager. Do you find that that's easier rather than like grassroots stuff? I guess they're playing the role of, of coach, of, of substitution man, of medical, of father, of mother or the whole lot do you, do you find that even though it's at that elite level and the pressures i would argue are probably higher with the the freedom you have to just focus on your role and your role alone you can be more successful um yeah but but i always have to be in a position and and, and danny we between us we call it the stids s-t-y-d-s so my role really is the stuff or the sh that you don't see. And I have to be prepared to deal with things behind the scenes that you don't see. And my reaction to that is crucial that, that I remain calm and I stay focused. There I am. The players are lined up, ready to go out onto the pitch. And I suddenly see that two players have got the same playing number, playing shirt on, those sorts of things. And Barry Middleton looks at me and he sees it as well and says, don't worry, Andy, we'll, short, we'll sort this. So there's no panic. There's no, it's, so those sorts of little things that derail you, no plan survives contact with the enemy. We know that contingency planning, what ifs, have I got the blood kit? Um, what happens if the bus doesn't turn up? Is there a contingency? All these sorts of things because I've been doing it a long time now, I've thought about as many of the contingencies that I can. I remain calm. It's a, it's, it's a well-rehearsed um, machine, if you like. So, you know, going back to that incident in the Olympic qualifier where Wardy got injured, you know, there, there is a very slick reaction, doctor, physio, we've almost practiced that sort of scenario before everybody knows what they're doing. and everybody knows what they're doing and that that generally because we're all experienced people on the staff that's generally how it works on match day Quan has a role russell has a role danny has a role on the bench i have a role on the bench sophie our physio and whoever is our doc that day we're all fairly well tuned into our sops as we call them standard operating procedures i think that's that's really important learning and actually if, if the whole point of these these videos and the, the these getting people on like yourself is to actually try and help filter some of that learning and knowledge down through the through the the levels and the ranks to different people who are actually interested in picking a bit more up more up so i think they uh, can really good value this evening so steph do you want to uh, close up yeah, I think as as Joel said, you know, really good, really good conversation tonight. I think some fantastic com uh, questions that have come in as well. So, hopefully, um, we've helped address some of the issues that maybe you guys have got going on in clubs and and, and schools and things like that at the moment. Um, and hopefully, give you a little bit of food for thought um, when, as and when we eventually get back out onto a pitch, which will be nice. Um, so yeah, no, thank you for um, thank you for coming to join us. As ever, if you've got any other questions or any thoughts that you would like to be uh, spoken about on these evenings, then get in touch either through the Hockey for Heroes page or um, through me on my uh, coaching or 
social media platforms, which is SJB underscore coaching on Twitter and in Instagram. So it'd be great to hear from you. But thank you, Andy. Thank you, Joel. It's been a really thank good you. evening. And thanks, everybody, for interacting. It's been really good. Cool. We'll see everyone later if I can ask you two to hold on the line and we will catch up with everyone soon.